as with a lot of episodes of Sci-Fi Pulsi, I'm going to tell you right now that some of what I'm going to say is probably going to be wrong. A lot of it's going to be extrapolation, and a fair amount of it is just going to be kind of me trying to invent things to make sense of a fragmented narrative. See, that's the issue with a lot of these really big series that take place over a really long period of time. The initial MTG plot took place over, what, like 10, 20 years, had dozens of authors, and frequently was retconned or altered based on uh, how they wanted the direction of the game to go. So coming up with like a canon co coherent timeline is very tricky, to put it the least. But I'm going to try to go through Phyrexia, New Phyrexia, and Yagmoth. So in the land, in the plane of Dominaria, which is the center of the multiverse, and I believe the largest plane, although as always these things, the canon, the canonicity, how reliable the narrator is, what the author believes, yada yada is kind of ambiguous. Uh, there was a civilization known as the Thrawn, the Thran, who were the most advanced civilization that the universe has ever known, or the multiverse, sorry, has ever known, and they carved out a huge empire in which there were a series of Thrawn city-states that covered much of the world. Um, a conflict eventually broke out between the Republicans who wanted more power for the Thrawn, um, the, the, uh, Thrawn working class and citizenry, as well as more independence for the city-states, versus the imperialists who wanted to maintain power with the ruling oligarchy, and maintain a more centralized form of government so they could continue to expand. Eventually, the imperialists won. However, as part of the Republicans, there was a doctor named Yagmoth. Yagmoth was kind of unique among the Thrawn because the Thrawn were obsessed with technology. Um, they despised flesh, they saw it as weak, and they believed that the way to build a better world was to make pure machines um, and dominate nature. Um, and to that end, they use devices called power stones, which are very roughly, I kind of view them as being kind of like plutonium. They kind of generate a radiation field that's used to power things, although they're also magical. But Yagmoth was not particularly interested in machines. Being a doctor and a healer, he was more interested in the biological. He thought that the way to perfect or to make a better world was through um, biology as opposed to machinery. So after he was on the losing side, he was exiled from the Thrawn Empire, and he wandered the world for many years. Uh, he was able to use his experiments to expand his lifespan, or the Thrawn might have had longer lifespan than modern humans. I'm not entirely sure what the timeline is like. But he wandered the world using various species as tests. He would go and mainly develop plagues to try to figure out how biology would work. He would kidnap hundreds and experiment upon them, tear them apart, see what made them tick. He would develop plagues as a way of testing the endurance of different civilizations, test out mutagens, etc. Uh, among them, the elves, the... Uh, a race of dwarves, minotaurs, etc. So after he did that, he eventually made his way back to the Thrawn capital. A disease knight known as, uh, it's a hard word to say, Pisces? Pisces? Pithesis? 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 I'll call it Pithesis, I guess. It's, it's really, it's spelt really weirdly. But a disease called Pithesis had broken out among the Thrawn which was caused by exposure to power stones. My personal view is, well, it's a magical disease. I think the most analogous thing we have in our world is cancer because it was caused by radiation. So my guess is it was, it caused tumors, the breakdown of the body's processes, uh, etc. So people who caught Tysis were confined to caverns underneath the Thrawn capital. Now, Yagmoth was able to make himself invaluable as being one of the few trained biologists. He was able to create a serum that repressed the symptoms of Tysis and allowed the, the, um, 
the people infected with it to live relatively normal lives. So he was eventually given more and more power and made kind of in charge, I don't know, the Surgeon Chancellor, the Supreme Medical Advisor of the Empire, and was given a great deal of executive power. Now what he would do is he would declare his political enemies to have Tysus and send them down to the caverns, whereas he would Fi, uh, be, indoctrinate people within the caverns and bring them back up pretending they were clear, uh, cured. However, during this point in time, Yagmoth, with the aid of a planeswalker, discovered the world that would become known as Phyrexia, which was an artificial plane made by a planeswalker long ago that was composed mostly of black mana. Yagmoth had finally found the place where he would create his paradise. During this entire process, Yagmoth had begun to experiment on those affected with Tysis, as he had he began to dilute the serum he was giving them to examine the effects of it. What he eventually realized is that by replacing diseased body parts with machines, he could halt the spread of the disease and make stronger, more powerful uh, beings that were closer to his idea of perfection. He developed, I guess, what we'd call cybernetics, but it was kind of an unholy amalgamation of fusing machines with biology, with um, black, uh, bound together by black magic, to create the nightmarish creatures that would eventually be known as Phyrexians. A Phyrexian is some sort of sentient being, be it a human, be it a demon, be it an angel, be it a dwarf or elf, who's undergone completion. Completion is a process in which the blood is replaced with oil. Oil, which is largely, I believe, a liquid form of black mana, although I don't know how particularly clear it is. The black oil was something they found on Phyrexia proper. So it's replacing that and it's completing their body, which is adding a whole bunch of cybernetic parts, altering their brain and... They're normally abominations. Most completed Phyrexians have additional limbs. They have certain powers, magical or mechanical, and they're incre they're much stronger than their previous forms. However, they're also insane and become fanatical devotees to Yagmoth. Now, back in Dominaria, a coalition of all the groups that uh, Yagmoth had pissed off came back and started try attempted to overthrow him. Now, he won that war, gaining increasing amounts of power within the Thrawn Empire. But eventually, I wasn't entirely clear on this reason, but my guess is uh, a palace coup among the Thrawn and the loss of uh, the loyalty of the Thrawn Empire combined with the coalition meant he began to lose the war and he decided to withdraw to Phyrexia for a time in order to build up his forces and then eventually return and conquer Dominaria. Unfortunately for him, there had been a permanent portal that had been created between Phyrexia and Dominaria and the caves beneath the Thrawn capital, where the Agman had kind of had his headquarters with all the indoctrinated. And he had killed the planeswalker who was helping him, dissecting him in an attempt to figure out how his spark worked. However, all this did was, well, ensure he didn't have a planeswalker on his side anymore. So as he retreated through the caverns, Rebecca, who had kind of been his lover, their relationship is really ambiguous, uh, succeeded in sealing the portal, trapping him forever on the other side of it in uh, Phyrexia. From there, Yogmoth, enraged at being trapped outside of what had been his home plane, vowed revenge against Dominaria. The other issue is that Phyrexia, like all artificial planes, was doomed to collapse one day thousands of years later. Yogmoth turned all of his attention towards com continuing his work of combining flesh and metal together to create the um, to create a, a perfect race, a completed race whose only purpose was to serve his will. As he was the man of vision, as he was the only man who could bring order to the multiverse, who could end the individualism and selfishness of the beings uh, within the multiverse and complete them and giving them purpose. So over the centuries, uh, millennia to be in fact, 
Yagmoth gradually built himself into a god. Residing at the center of Phyrexia, he gave up his body to become a creature purely of black mana that could change his, his form as, uh, at will and is likely the most powerful being to ever exist in the magic universe, with the possible exception of Gaia herself, who is the only true god that we know of and who is the goddess of Dominaria. So Yagmoth spent untold millennia plotting his revenge, and during this time period, Phyrexia was made into a... They hollowed out the planet, and they made a number of spheres. Uh, one sphere has an ocean where they produce the glistening oil. One sphere ha is where they grow the organic Phyrexians. One sphere is where they do other stuff, etc., etc. So over time, they developed the hierarchy. Now, the ideology of Phyrexia is kind of difficult to understand, it's a strange combination of natural selection and um, survival and uh, collectivism, and I know those two things are kind of mutually exclusive. And Phyrexian ideology is sort of hard to explain, but basically, the goal of Yogmoth is to complete the known universe. That is to convert everything into a Phyrexian, to the ideal mixture of man and machine, and to continue to develop this. Uh, to kind of take the nightmare as far as it can go and to endlessly experiment and endlessly alter until he creates the perfect race of uh, super beings. So all Phyrexians worship Yagmoth. They call him the Lord of the Waste, the ineffable, ineffable, the father of machines. Every Phyrexian is willing to give their life for Yagmoth, and he is their one and only god. Phyrexians are completely, utterly willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, that good being the will of Yagmoth. At the same time, within this hierarchy, they are backstabbing, conniving, constantly trying to overthrow and kill one another, and are encouraged in this, as the survival of the fittest is an ideal part of it. Within Phyrexia itself, even though there's this extreme collectivism, there's also people uh phyrexians will devour one another there's kind of as far as i could determine like local little wars that break out however despite their infighting all are ultimately loyal to yagmoth and will stop their their petty struggles at the first sign that he gives them orders so yagmoth tried to return to dominaria a number of times over the years when urza and mishra accidentally reopened the portal he had escaped from he sent in gix and a number of phyrexians to begin infiltration they were able to sway mishra to their cause and began to work behind the scenes converting him and many of his leadership into phyrexians the idea being that once he defeated urza urza who symbolized the thrawn obsession with pure machines unhindered by organics that Mish they could use Mishra's empire as a springboard to conquer the rest of Dominaria, and Yagmoth would finally have his revenge. Dominaria would be converted into the true Phyrexia, and from there they would launch a grand crusade to conquer and complete all the multiverse. It should be important to note that in Magic the Gathering, every planet or plane is its own pocket dimension existing within the multiverse. I think it should also be noted that we really have no idea how big any of these planes are. Dominaria is generally regarded as the largest, and it's at least as big as Earth. I think it's probably a lot bigger than Earth. It's very confusing. I don't think there's outer space. I think if you go high enough into the sky, there's like an invisible barrier or something that separates it from other planes. I don't think each universe has its own like star system and stuff. It's very confusing. I don't entirely understand how it works. But Phyrexia, I think, is a lot smaller than Dominaria. Maybe it's the size of the moon, maybe smaller than that. I think, like, Kamigawa is only the size of Japan. But if other planes are smaller, then that would help to explain the relative size of Dominaria and why the Phyrexians couldn't just easily overrun it. But anyways, as the Brother War went on, and Urza and Mishra fought, the Brother War ended with Urza using the Stylus Blast to annihilate both his army and Mishra's army, removing the Phyrexians from Dominaria once again and creating the World Shard, which was a 
dimensional barrier that prevented the Phyrexians from returning. So as time went on, eventually Urza would come back to Dominaria. Urza attempted to invade Phyrexia by himself, but got his ass kicked and was driven insane by Yagmoth. But that's kind of another story. So Phyrexia would continue after Urza returned to Dominaria to try to send infiltrators in. However, Dominaria proved too strong for infiltrators to have much of an impact, and Yogmoth came up with a plan. If he couldn't defeat Dominaria through infiltration, he would defeat it through direct combat. To this end, he began to build Wrath. Now, Wrath was a pocket dimension combined with Dominaria. Uh, Wrath was created by having Flowstone manufactories. Flowstone is a substance, a metal-like liquid substance that can be transformed into just about everything. And basically they gathered energy, I think, from different planes of the multiverse and sent it to Wrath and converted it into energy. The eventual idea was to merge Wrath with Dominaria and to cover Wrath with Phyrexian soldiers. Now the Phyrexians do have access to portal technology and they can send people to Dominaria. And eventually, during the invasion, they do send a massive fleet of warships to Dominaria using portal devices, which raises the issue of why they didn't just do that in the first place. My best guess is portals are so expensive and difficult to build, even for the Phyrexians, probably because they require a lot of um, specialized parts that aren't very common, even if you have control multiple planes that they had spent the last like 7,000 years gathering as many portals as possible and they used all of them up during the invasion. Given that the ships alone were ultimately defeated and if they had not had Wrath, the Phyrexian invasion would have failed, it kind of makes sense why they had to build Wrath. So during the invasion, the first wave, which was a massive Phyrexian armada that came in through portals, was defeated at great cost. The second phase of the invasion was where Wrath overlaid with Dominaria, bringing billions of Phyrexians into the world. Now at that stage, it was largely kind of a stalemate. Um, the Phyrexians had, were making a lot of gains, but were unable to knock out the Dominarians. The Dominarians were unable to remove the Phyrexians. However, Urza during this time enacted his long-term plan. Together with a number of other planeswalkers, he had spent centuries producing the Titan engines, mountain-sized mechs that would allow the planeswalkers to survive the harsh environment of Phyrexia. Killing one of the planeswalkers who betrayed them, he used the planeswalker spark to charge soul bombs, which are basically nuclear weapons. They were detonated through various parts of Phyrexia, utterly devastating it. By the time the final soul bomb succeeded in going off, Phyrexia was left a shell of its former self. Whether or not it could survive and even had the resources to rebuild is an open question. Now, Phyrexia did have a colonial empire. They had conquered a number of other planes, such as Mercadia. But as I, I said, my guess is a lot of planes are very small. And even though Phyrexia had conquered dozens or perhaps hundreds of them, they didn't provide as many resources as one might think. Also, I think portals were still expensive and difficult for the Phyrexians to use. So a lot of the worlds they co they conquered, I think honestly, they just controlled from behind the scenes. Like in Mercadia, they didn't take it over directly. They just had like a puppet government. So my guess is most of the worlds they sort of controlled were just used to extract certain resources they needed, but they never really had the resources to directly occupy them. So after it being destroyed, a bunch of stuff happened. Yagmoth himself eventually came to um, came to Dominaria in the form, of, his true form, a massive cloud of black mana. However, I won't go into detail, but using the legacy weapon, Urza's spark, and a bunch of other stuff, Yagmoth was finally killed and defeated his whatever it is like ten thousand year plan for revenge failed however the event was so devastating it was known as the apocalypse and dominaria was left almost as much of a ruin as phyrexia now whether or not yagmoth actually died is one of the most hotly debated questions in the fandom 
In the book Scourge, where we have Corona, the false god, she seeks out the she attempts to seek out the gods of the various colors of mana. Among them, she seeks she is able to have a conversation with Yagmoth, who remarks that he's still alive, although extremely badly injured. She also goes briefly to Phyraxia and sees that it's being rebuilt extremely slowly. Whether or not in this continuity Phyraxia will be rebuilt is an open matter. Um, open question, uh, sorry, rebuilt before the plane finally collapses is an open question. Whether or not it even can be rebuilt and whether or not Yagmoth can retain any of his further power is also an open question. Now this is kind of an issue with the continuity because canonically Yagmoth was dead. Then they retconned his death in Scourge and said, no, Yagmoth is alive, just badly injured. And then in Time Spiral, they're like, no, Yagmoth is really dead. We were just joking when he said he wasn't dead, which was confusing to everybody. But Phyrexia was not done. Um, Yagmoth may have been dead, but his memory lived on. A drop of glistening oil was carried with Karn to the plan of Mirrodin that he built. From there, it proceeded to infect the plain, and a new race of Phyrexians emerged, bearing ancestral memories of the machine orthodoxy and of the old world. Now, they didn't know who Yogmoth was, but many of his ideas lived on. So the new Phyrexians, as opposed to the old Phyrexians, were not only uh, consisted of black mana, they consisted of all five types of mana. So... In the new Phyrexia block, in the Scars of Mirrodin, we can see the Phyrexian ideology applied to each color. Each color of magic built their own version of it. Once again, the completionism, the desire for perfection combined with the collectivism, seeing uh, in which way, uh, and we see that it, it being adapted in different ways. The green Phyrexians took the perspective that a complete de-emphasis on thought and consciousness was necessary and that the only thing that uh, that Phyrexia should not only have rule of the strong but it should have no rule whatsoever within green Phyrexia there's limitless growth of completed beings who fight one another for supremacy now the supreme beings within that do not actually rule per se they just keep devouring and killing everything else they believe that eventually uh, this process of natural selection will lead to perfect beings who will be able to take over the multiverse uh, through sheer power. They completely reject the idea of any kind of planning or leadership, though. Next is the blue faction, which is probably, in my view, kind of the most normal-ish. Basically, they take the perspective that perfect, the pursuit of perfection is an intellectual quest, that they need to gather knowledge from all over the multiverse and conduct endless experiments to try to build more perfect beings. That is, they conduct experiments um, to optimize things, and they endlessly modify themselves as more advanced technology and graphing becomes available. At the same time, they don't have uh, necessarily the same internal fighting, at least as far as I could determine, that some of the other factions do. The faction that had the hardest time with Phyrexian ideology is red, uh, because red is the color of passion, compassion, individualism, and freedom, and is the exact opposite of Phyrexian ideology. The red Phyrexians largely try to busy themselves with work and try not to think too much about how unhappy they are and how uncomfortable they are. Interestingly enough, as the Phyrexian War with Mirrodin happens, the Red Phyrexians allow um, Mirrodin refugees to live among them, and they simply ignore them, as the vestigial aspects of compassion make them not want to kill defenseless beings. So they basically just ignore them. If they get in their way, they will kill them, but otherwise, they just leave them alone, provided they don't offer any resistance. So kind of the two dominant factions within New Phyrexia, and the ones that are probably the most like Yagmoth, are the white and black. We'll go with black next. So black believes that the in order for Phyrexia to be complete, in order for it to regain its position, they need a new Yagmoth. They need a new father of the machines. They need a new super being who will come and 
unify Phyrexia. So there's a number of feudal overlords who rule over black and they continually make alliances with one another and fight each other off. The idea being that eventually one of them will emerge who will become the new god of Phyrexia and the new father of machines and they will have completion then. So that's more or less what black is. There's an underclass and an overclass within their society and everything is based around the struggle between the various overlords because if one is able to unite them then they will i don't know launch a coup or try to get the rest of phyrexia to acknowledge him as the new father of machines so the last faction probably the most interesting is white now you might say how could white be adapted to phyrexia white is the polar opposite of black well, white and black are opposites, but they're also similar. They have similar basic ideas. They just take opposite positions on them. So white takes the collectivism and the religious aspects of Phyrexia to its ultimate form. What they believe is they, they take the collectivism and the completionism and they say the way to complete a being is to get rid of its individuality. Um, the completionism plus collectivism means rebuilding beings so that they no longer have individuality. So most members of the white faction are dermophobic. That is, they have a fear of skin. So what they tend to do is remove their skin and replace it with white porcelain as a symbol that they aren't individuals anymore. It, it um, By destroying their skin, they, de they destroy the difference in, of, of appearance and they symbolically get rid of what separates them from other Phyrexians. So as they're completed, they're given specific positions within the white hierarchy. Everyone within white Phyrexia is a priest, a cleric, a soldier, etc. And as, as more are brought in, they continue to complete them and make more and more of them. Now, many, of course, don't survive this, etc. There is a feeling among the white Phyrexians as well that there's a need for a new leader, that there needs to be another father of machines, as it were, to lead Phyrexia towards its, its perfection. Many of them believe that Karn, the creator of Mirrodin, and uh, Planeswalker is that person, but Alesh Norn, the unofficial leader, or well, the official leader of all white Phyrexians, believes herself to be that leader, and more or less has manipulated and gained control of the Phyrexian religion for the eventual her eventual goal of becoming the uh, Grand Cenobit and controlling all of Phyrexia. Eventually what winds up happening is there's kind of a Phyrexian civil war of sorts and the white faction succeeds in dominating the others. Alesh Norn more or less becomes the new father of machines and Phyrexia becomes a theocracy worshipping her. Their goal being to eventually merge all beings in the universe together. Uh, a common thing that the, the um, white Phyrexians do is sow multiple people together uh, to try to create new beings that possess the minds of multiple uh, individuals fused into one. Ultimately, what they would really like to do is to sow all beings in the universe together to create one super being and then merge with their god. Um, kind of like the human instrumentology project, but even more twisted. So ultimately, I'm sure that the white Phyrexians will try to expand and conquer more of the multiverse. However, their long-term goals remain to be seen, as is the long-term effects of essentially winning over the other groups of Phyrexians. So... That was my attempt to kind of cover new, old and new Phyrexia, Yawgmoth, and the various factions that emerged after the collapse of old Phyrexia and the foundation of new Phyrexia. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something, and I'll talk to you guys later.